Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray. And make no mistake, this is your source for all things black and gold. Football just wouldn't be football without Berwick Rangers. Stand by for this edition of the Let It BRFC podcast. Welcome to the Let BRC Podcast. I'm Adam Hunter and I'm joined by Dave Buglis as my co-host today. Hi Dave, how are you? I'm fine Adam, thank you very much. All good. good. I've just been speaking to a friend, Kevin Haynes, who's, uh, he sends his best wishes tonight. He's uh, just been checking in to make sure he's got enough training balls for the 8th of August. So he's uh, planning now in full prep. Great stuff. What's the start day for training? Uh, the guys start back on the 8th of August, Saturday the 8th of August, 12 noon. Um, first training session at PFML for one hour, um, where they'll be issued with uh, uh, GPS vests. I've already, I think this week they're going to give them the kit. Um, obviously, we need to they need to keep their own kit and stuff like that, just you know, just through the COVID stuff and that. So, um, but yeah, all, all is good. So, they're looking forward to. It. Is it contact training? Uh, not yet. No. So it'll be cardio, boxes, small drills. Not be it to begin with. So. And our guest this week, we have Andy Thorpe, a head of women and girls program at Barrett Rangers, and Dr. Tracy Donaghy, a technical director for the women and girls program too. Hi guys, how are you? Very well, thank you. Very well. Yeah, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, for the benefit of the listeners, um, this is the second attempt at this podcast <laughs> recording. <laughs> uh, the first one didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's hoping that we'll get through this one. Um, so Dave, starting with yourself, you, we released in the um, on social media over the last couple of weeks around a diploma in sport being offered to the team. Do you want to talk a little bit around that? Yeah, um, since since it is a re-recording, we can give an update now. Um, myself, Graham Gurney, and other directors, um, Kevin Haynes, assistant manager, and. Um, Four of the players, five of the players, uh, we're going through a diploma uh, in leadership and sport, um, which is uh, a follow-on group to Chelsea, first team, coaching staff in Leeds United. Um, so basically, it's an eight-week course, uh, Monday afternoons at three o'clock, we join a, um, a webinar uh, with a lecturer, and um, this week we had to do an analysis on Sir Alex Ferguson's leadership style, and whether it was mm-hmm. transactional or transformational. Um, and yeah, no, it's good. Um, and I, I can't see any of us not passing it. Um, it's quite straightforward and laid back. Um, you've got John Daly, Christoph Berra, Joelle. Joelle Murray's actually on it now. She's joined as well. Uh, and Jordan Tate. Um, obviously, you know, names that Berwick fans will be familiar with. But yeah, no, um, I guess we did it because we know we're probably not the best players. But we also think that, you know, giving the guys some kind of education and support for the careers outside football is important. So, so far, so good. And we've all genuinely um, appreciated it. And indeed, yesterday I was on a physical preparation course with the SFA uh, with Graham Henderson, who's the head of sports science at Falkirk. Uh, and Callum Smith uh, was on that as well yesterday. So Callum's been throwing himself into courses in his spare time while he's been off work furloughed. Great. Um, and we also announced around the girls and women's taster sessions. What's the uptake of that been like? Yeah, no, um, we first announcement was last Monday. I think we did a wee chaser again at the weekend. Uh, I know Andy and Tracy are keen to get me to get sorted out flyers and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's somewhere on my list of things to do this ne- next couple of days, uh, along with a new tractor. Um, yeah, no, initial response has been good. Um, we've had, uh, I think, over eight within a week, which is brilliant. Um, and we're just going to keep pushing it out. So we try to use the local media, the local press. Um, I dropped an email today to Bauer Media, who own uh, radio borders as well, um, which is they're quite difficult to get at times. But yeah, so delighted so far. Um, everything going well. And then at Old Shield this week, we've also had uh, um, Newcastle United Foundation again. So you know there is football back at the facility at the moment, which has been fantastic. So what was your involvement, sorry, in the the women and girls program? Um, for me, when I walked back through the door in January, I suspect it was one of the things I wanted to do because I knew I knew that we should have it, and that was largely from my stint at City for the last couple of years. Um, you know, it's obviously grown at a hell of a pace. Last year's World Cup 
goes to prove that, you know, um, over a billion people kind of watched it, 82 million watched the cup final and, you know, you've got 2.63 million women playing in, in England alone over 16 and 14,000 in Scotland and actually since we last spoke, I think <coughs> City, have, City have now signed the South African captain from the World Cup last year, Janine Van Wyck, who's 177 caps. I think she was asked the question this week if she'd be able to catch Joe Love, who's on 190 odd, but um, it's just a thing that I think we should be doing and I think you know, I get we did record this other week and we're doing it again, but I think the supporters will hear quite clearly from listening to Andy and Tracy that, you know, when they were in girls and women's football, maybe a few years back initially, life was a little bit tougher. So, you know, hopefully the popularity of it now means that this is going to be, you know, quite a buzz for us, for the club and for the, you know, the two individuals that we've managed to secure. So, so I think I'll, I'll just be a shadow in the background. <laughs> You've I'll been be heavily involved. <laughs> You've been heavily involved in, in Glasgow City, um, but what's your, your plans for that going forward? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'll, I've committed to get, I need to get the academy <coughs> back on, which we have done. Uh, there's a, we've got a head of academy, Jamie. He's done an amazing job getting the kids back in. So again, since we spoke last, the girls are back training. Uh, all the COVID procedures are in place. Um, they're all paying again as well, but we've reduced the rates uh, and fees because at the minute they're training, but they're not playing games. So we've been fair with the parents and, you know, for some parents, it's been quite tough financially. So, um, and then obviously we've got prep for the Champions League at the end of August. So yeah, no, I mean, I made a lot of friends, uh, whether it be upstairs or whether it be players, you know, lifelong friends. So hopefully I'll be able to use some of those relationships with what we're trying to do at Berwick. And actually at the minute, there's a game provisionally penciled in on the 30th of August where City's 19s are due to come down to Shieldfield and play Berwick and Bells um, after one of the taster sessions. So. So I'll be around and, and still helping out. Great. Great. And I think the, the first game that we played on Shieldfield went down quite well, despite it being a, a match day. Um, I think we were away at Sterling at the, on the day. Um, but I think there was over 120 people there, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. No, it was a good turnout, actually. Um, and there were young Scottish internationals, 16s and 17s playing. So um, I think people were just curious to see what it would look like. And what was really nice was the Russian girls that play within the, the Berwick Rangers programme um, and some of the boys' teams, you know, no doubt, like, Tracy didn't, she'll explain herself, but it was nice to see them come along and watch girls' teams playing, um, you know, so just to kind of see what it was like. And actually, even seeing their faces in the change room, getting the photographs taken in that, it was, you know, Ian Runnison was there taking the photos as he does for the first team. And it was great just seeing their faces, you know, with, with players that were playing at a higher level. So, but yeah, it was good. Great stuff. So last question before I let you off the hook. Um, yeah. Time and Tweed uh, sponsored the programme. What's his sponsorship for? Yeah, no, it was amazing, actually. Um, Stuart Brown at Tyne and Tweed Financial Services has been a big supporter of the club for years. Um, and he'd done something for the season ahead of game, which was fantastic. And then he saw the flyer or the announcement we were doing this and we'd appointed Andy and Tracy and he got in touch and I spoke to him. And um, for me, whenever you ask for something of someone, you've got to give something back. But Stuart was very clear up front. He wasn't after anything major. He just wanted to help us get going. So... Um, Andy and Tracy will be the best kitted out coaches at the club with a new cap of gear. <laughs> uh, and likewise, I think Andy now has at his house 40 footballs, 20 size fours and 20 size threes and all the cones under the sun and bibs. So they should have all arrived now. But you know, not one penny has been spent by us. So it's a huge thank you to Stuart and his family and his business um, for doing that. Because these are the costs that you know kill clubs, kill, kill setups when they begin. So it was a massive, uh, a massive help for us. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, Andy, for yourself, can you tell us a little bit of your background in football, uh, coaching in the women's game? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I didn't start. I was a player coach when I was younger, from sort of the age of 19, 20. I had a group of mates. We started a team, played in, obviously, I'm from the East End of London, so we played on Hackney Marshes, the famous Hackney Marshes, 88 pitches all on one site. So that was uh, one of our regular away haunts. Um, did that for years. Came up, to, came up to Scotland, lived in Scotland for a while, um, played in the Edinburgh Sunday Morning League, which was uh, a little bit lively, to say the least. Um, no registrations for players, so anybody could play. It was all the band people from Saturday afternoon. So, yeah. <laughs> I got to move really, really quick. I learned to move really, really quickly. Um, but some of the players were really good standards, so that was, that was quite interesting. Uh, then moved to Berwick in 99, um, carried on playing in Edinburgh for a while. And then um, I've been playing sort of senior football since then. Um, 
I ended up doing my, I went off and did a coaching badge. I'm, I'm quite interested in learning and development. Um, so I ended up doing a, a coaching badge off my own bat with the first FA level one course in 2009. Uh, and they said, really, if you, I really just intended to do a little bit of guest coaching. That was my plan. That's how it all starts. That was my plan. Um, and they said, look, you need to find a team really to be out of practice, etc." So um, I've got a mate who lives local, Big Steve, his name is. He's a big Millwall fan, which goes down well because I'm West Ham. Um, <laughs> and he was coaching at Lowick United. So he said to me, he said, well, come over. I'll have a word with the guys running it. So um, I went over one October night, freezing cold, um, over to the, the uh, Astro we had, we've got in Berwick. And if you know the Astro in Berwick, it's a, it's a, it's a hockey pitch. So the wind was whistling and I went over, introduced myself. Um, so there was a few teams training that night. Loic used to have about 10 or 12 teams. Um, so he said, look, if you want to coach with me, he said, I'm coaching the women's team. And I never had a clue. I'd never coached a women's team before. I never really knew too much about women's football. Um, so I went along, put out the cones, helped out, got chatting to the, the women. Um, and a lot of them were young girls, of sort of 16, 17 year olds. Um, Joined in the kickabout, had some fun. It was good. It was good. No pressure. So I was like the sort of water boy for the first uh, half of the season. Um, so they were playing in the Northumberland County League. So that season they finished, I think they finished fourth or fifth in a sort of, I think, 10 team league. Um, but they made the cup final, which was great. So we had a good day down at Whitley Bay, Whitley Beer. Never been to Whitley Beer before, right next to the ice rink. So that was fun. That's um, not a bad accent. Do you like that? Was, oh, it was I, decent, yeah, yeah. I try my best, I try my best. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I was down at Whitley, um, and we ended up losing in extra time, but the girls played really well. It was a really good performance. Um, got to the end of the season, and then uh, the guy who was running it, Bill, um, he announced on the, it was actually the awards night for the women, and he announced that he was um, leaving, and uh, cause he was going to work for Berwick Rangers, funny enough. He was going to run their sort of the under-19s development squad. So we all sort of looked at each other on the night and it was like, oh, so I really didn't want to run the team. That was my first thought. So, oh my God, I'm gonna be, I don't want to really run the team. Anyway, I had a chat with um, a couple of women and one of the, the goalkeeper at the time, Dawn, um, who ended up being my assistant coach for the team. Uh, she said, look, let's give it a go. Let's give it a real go. So I ended up getting the, get the women together. We had a meeting and I just said to them, look, we've got three chances here. There's, there was a a sort of girls team as well that Lowick had at the time and these girls were coming up to 16 so I said we can just keep it going for a year and just play and wait for the young ones to come up you can fold completely if you really don't want to play or if you really want to do it really let's go for it and get some you know bodies in etc so um, they decided they really wanted to give it a go so they got a couple of players who used to play they came back one had had a child so she came back um, and we started the season and we thought, oh, it'll be okay. And then we just, it was really bizarre. We sort of started the season, we got some training going, they all turned up regularly. And the one thing, the one thing that people had said to me a few times, a few other male coaches, uh, sexist male coaches, should I add, is that oh, girls and women, when it gets cold, they won't like it. You know, they won't turn up for training. When it gets cold, they won't do this. So anyway, never out of bother. They turned up week in, week out, regularly turned up. We started the season. And we, we just, we won the first game and then we won the second game and then we won the third game and then we won the fourth game. And we ended up going through the whole season and I think we won 17 games and drew three. So it was a complete, we called them the Invincibles, never lost all season. So um, that was, it was just crazy. It just, it was like a rolling, you know, like a snowball rolling down a hill. It just got better and better as you went along. Um, they did really, really well. Um, we ended up getting through to the sort of fifth round of the Women's FA Cup went down to Blackpool to play Blackpool in the FA Cup. Um, and it was really different because the, on the, the normal league games, you can have rolling subs. So you can have up to five subs and you can roll in subs. So everybody got a game. Of course, it was the FA Cup. You can only use three subs. So that was really, really, really difficult to get that sorted. So we did that, ended up losing. I sort of played a, a weaker team in the first half. I wanted to give everybody a game as much as I could. Got the stronger ones on the second half and we were, I think, 3-0 down at half time. And we brought it back to 3-2. And had it gone on for another five minutes, I think we would have won it. Um, but we got knocked out of that. Um, but we'd had a great, great weekend. 
um, we'd stayed in a hotel overnight and it was uh, they were really sensible the night before went out for a meal they weren't drinking mad it was it was just they really really took it seriously um, second season we went to the did the league again ended up only losing one league game um, and drew, drew the league at the top we won the league we were joint winners with Ashington um, we won our last game of the season they drew which really helped us so uh, that gave us two league titles in a row and then the third year we decided to go up to the Northeast Regional so we went up to the Northeast Regional Women's League and again um, first four or five games we ended up winning every week it, they were playing really well we were traveling the country because it goes right down to York and that was the one big thing with uh, the Northeast League is you're looking at a whole day traveling I mean you were looking at getting up getting minibuses getting it sorted so that became a bit onerous and I gave it a go until just about just before Christmas um, and then one of the other guys took over which worked well it was, I needed a bit of a break so that, that worked quite well and sadly they should have won that league they ended up finishing runners up on an administrative error they actually won more games and had more points than the, the team that won but there was an admin error on one of the team sheets which was ridiculous I'll be honest so they ended up losing that which was a real shame um, then, I, then I took a break I thought I'm definitely going to have a break this time from coaching um, ended up coaching a boys team finished off a boys team for the end of the season just to help them out at Lowick and then I was over at Lowick one night and um, I was just helping out with the getting the ground measured out and getting stuff done and the grass cut and stuff as you do as part of a grassroots team and the girls team turned up now the girls team had started the season before it was 2012 and they'd, they'd put an advert out for the Olympics so just to give girls a game of football and I think loads turned up, it was over 20 turned up. So they ended up playing in the Glendale League, which is a boys' league. Um, got absolutely hammered every week, but really enjoyed themselves. Um, yeah, we're getting beat 10, 12 every week, uh, but turned up rain and snow. They were there every week. So, um, so anyway, these girls turned up, the season had finished. They turned up for training. And there'd been a mix up, and the coaches had not turned up. So they were all over. And I was sort of there. And one of the parents said, well, would you take them for a session? So I said, yeah, yeah, I don't mind doing that. So took them for a session, really enjoyed it. There was some real talent in there. Um, uh, the other coaches ended up leaving. So they said, well, would you be coach? So again, you know, it was one of those where I got the parents in. We met, got all the parents in for a meeting. We met at the Grove, which used to be there, not there anymore. The old Berwick Rangers pub. Uh, met in the Grove, had a good chat and said, look, we're going to do it, we'll do it properly. Um, and we ended up the girls' league. Uh, the only problem with that is it was a central venue in Newcastle. So uh, we got a minibus, made a commitment. And uh, for that season, first season, every, you know, I had a parent in the bus with me every week. We went up and down 140 mile round trip for every game. So I think we did, we did it for two seasons in the central venue. We finished sort of sixth in the first season um, and a sort of fourth or fifth in the second season. So I worked out it was over 3,000 miles we did each year just to play football. And again, they turned up rain, snow, and they were, um, they were always a year younger than the other teams we played because they'd played a two-year age gap in the Glendale. But they were always a year younger. But I could see that um, they were very, very dedicated, very talented group of girls. Um, and then very similar to the women's team, we, we ended up winning a cup. Um, it was the first cup I've ever actually won. It was the girls I've coached for years, never, ever won a cup, always lost cup finals. So... That was the first couple I ever won with the girls. Then we won a Northeast tournament, a summer tournament, which was really positive. Um, and then again, it was a bit like the women's season. We started the league, did well, winning, winning, winning. And again, we ended up going a whole season unbeaten. Um, again, 17 wins and three draws, funny enough. I think we scored something ridiculous, like 120 goals and letting about 15. So it was, it was really, really positive. Um, and then the following season, we went again, started winning games. And then the, the pro clubs came a-calling. So, um, yeah, so pro clubs came a-calling. And before the end of the season, we ended up losing, I think, five players uh, out of the team. So three went to, two or three went to Hearts, a couple of went to Hibs. Um, and you can't blame them, you know, they were, they were interested in moving on. So got to the end of that season, and in the end, eight of them signed for various pro clubs. So we had one at Sunderland. We did particularly well. Megan, she's... She played against Man City and went to Liverpool and her parents drove her everywhere. Um, and then other girls went to Hibs and Hearts and uh, Newcastle. So, so that was the end of that, really. That was a couple of years ago now. Um, we had a really good time. And what we created was a real 
uh, team ethic. We were just one group of one group. There was no younger girls, no older girls. We were sort of one off in Berwick. Um, even though we were low at United, it was a group of girls from Berwick. Um, and they all became firm friends. And, and I've always said, you know, what we created there was something really, really special because we created, I like to create nice people, good people. You know, they were honest, they were decent, they played the game the right way, they didn't go kicking people, they accepted decisions from the referee, the parents were really good, they weren't jumping on down, screaming on the sidelines. Um, so no, that was really, really positive. And I'm still in touch with all of them. So they let me know what they're doing. So um, yeah, they, it's been very, very positive. So, so then I thought I could take a proper break and just play football. So I like playing senior football. So um, yeah, I didn't think I'd get back into coaching, I'll be honest, or get back involved. So. It took what? a bit to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> what swayed you? Well, it was, it was interesting. I, I was quite surprised. I got a call from Dave, um, messaged me and said, could we have a chat? Um, and he's, uh, yeah, he's quite persuasive. He's quite persuasive. And he was excited and prepared to, you know, put the effort and time in, I think. Um, we did have a good chat, actually. We looked at what I'd done, what he'd done in the game. Um, and Berwick needs Berwick needs to have something. I mean, you've got the nearest two clubs to us. You've got Anik down in the south who do a fantastic job with girls. They've been really good. And actually, I think five of the five of the young girls that played for me are there. Four or five are there. And the women's team that were at Lowick ended up going to Anik. So they're uh, a majority of the women's team that first started with the old Lowick girls. So um, they've got a really good positive um, way of working with girls. Lots of girls teams. And in the north, you've then got up to Hibs, which is obviously you've got the Hibs Academy, which is excellent as well. So we really need something in Berwick because kids are having to travel, you know, either way they're traveling an hour one way or sort of 35, 45 minutes the other way. So um, to have something actually in our town to fill that gap between us and Edinburgh and us and Anik is, is a real positive, I think. So. Definitely. And Dave, it's, it's going to sit within the Community Foundation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um... It's an interesting one. Um, when you look at the foundation model, there's a number of streams, uh, well-being, community projects, et cetera, et cetera. But Pathway um, is the, where, where this would typically sit. Um, you know, clubs that I'm familiar with up here, where I live in Falkirk, you know, Falkirk FC, um, Stenhouse Muir, Greenock Morton, et cetera. These kind of initiatives are within the foundation. So they're not isolated from um, being involved with the club, but at the same time, they're not in the club. So this will be, you know, one of the, the first projects or the worst, the, f the first kind of sort of deliverables for the foundation. And I know that um, now that obviously Warren's name's out, I know Warren's really, really keen uh, to work with Andy and Tracy. I think the three guys have been all trying to work out the diaries and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, it is a foundation uh, deliverable, which is absolutely fantastic. So two, bir two, two birds with one stone, so... <laughs> Uh, and I, Andy, you mentioned about being a West Ham fan. So what's your, your earliest memories of following West Ham? Uh, well, the only reason, it's really interesting. My dad weren't really interested in football, strangely enough. He wasn't a big football fan. Um, but my sister ended up marrying a guy who played for West Ham Reserves. And he then had a career in sort of play for South End and other teams. So he took me over one day and that was it, really. Um, I was hooked on the crowd. So as I always say, it's, West Ham's a bit like sport in Newcastle as well. It's the... It teaches you the idea of hope over reality. So <laughs> we genuinely think we're going to do all right and this is going to be our year. So, um, yeah, it, it's, there's never a dull moment with the two teams. You know, they never fail to... They beat the good ones and lose against the poor ones. So you never know what you're going to get. Honestly, it drives me crazy. But, um, yeah, I've always liked the fact we try and play good football. Um, where I'd say I was brought up in the East End. And in my, when I went to school, in my school, you had West Ham, Tottenham and Arsenal. I mean, everybody supported Leighton Orient because they were the local team. So everybody supported Leighton Orient, a bit like the Berwick local team. And then you all had a, a big team. So you had West Ham, Arsenal or, or Tottenham. So I didn't get a lot of joy at school, to be honest. Not a lot of uh, great moments. But um, no, no, it's, it's, it's that community family club that I've really liked the idea of. And, you know, they've all, there's always an interesting player, whether it be the likes of Trevor Brookian or Alan Devonshire or Paolo Di Canio, or, you know. We've always had something a bit different about them. They, they, and they, you know, they, they drive me mad. But uh, <laughs> it's really interesting. I was on, a, I was on um, uh, a Zoom when Liam Craig was doing one of his Zoom um, lectures. I was on the Zoom and West Ham were playing in the background. And uh, it was really funny. I tried to keep it all in. I'm doing my best to keep it all in. And um, West Ham scored a goal. So I was absolutely delighted. So I'm still like, anyway, so, and it got, 
got varred off. So I was absolutely raging. I couldn't believe it. And then the what opposition, <laughs> and then the opposition went down the other end and scored. And then I just got a little message come up from uh, Robert Curl Curley. He just said, "I can see you raging inside, but you're trying to keep it in." You could see it in my face. I was on the Zoom. <laughs> I said, I typed him back. I said, "I thought I was doing really, really well." So uh, there you go. <laughs> Heart on your sleeve and all that. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's ridic- but it is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thing to the idea of football and the, the fact you feel certain ways about certain teams. I'm sure Tracy could uh, write a thesis on it. I'm sure she may have already written a thesis on it, but uh, <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. And this idea that you, I'm really, really connected with everybody at West Ham, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you see someone's, you know, it's been a murder on telly and there's a murderer comes on and he's a West Ham fan. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't be that bad. You know, can't be that <laughs> There must be something good in there somewhere. You know, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> You told me Leighton Orient, do you see Yaya Toure has been training with him? Yes, yes. Oh, well, I was actually at Leighton Orient last year. My friend, I went down, um, did a training course in London, and I got a mate who's really into Leighton Orient. He, he works for him, and his wife does sort of uh, community stuff. Um, so it was great. We were on the pitch and chatting away. So, yeah, he's just training to keep himself fit. He's training to keep himself fit, so trying to do his best. I actually played on the pitch. It was really good. My wife from the old school team, we played on the pitch, which is brilliant. But I was so excited. It's such a big pitch, huge pitch. I was really excited. So we were running about sort of 20 minutes before the game. So the time the game came, I was absolutely shattered. But, uh, just, <laughs> you know, when you're full of excitement, you just can't stop running about. So <laughs> I was young. I was young at the time. How would you like to be in with a chance of winning a thousand pounds every month? If that sounds appealing to you, because it sure does to me, you need to join Berwick Ranger Supporters Club's monthly draw. For just five pounds per month, you'll go into a draw with hundreds of other Dream Team supporters to win the monthly jackpot. In addition to the £1,000 prize, the Supporters Club will be donating £250 each month to a chosen local charity, with the rest of the profits from the draw going to the football club. For details on how to sign up, visit berwickrangers.com or message the supporters organisation on Facebook, Berwick Rangers Supporters Club, or on Twitter at BRFC Sup Club. Berwick Rangers Supporters Club, supporting your club and your community. Uh, Tracy, welcome to the club and welcome to town. Um, what's brought about the move? Hello. Um, so I moved to Berwick uh, two months ago now, um, and I moved here because I was appointed the post of a lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at Newcastle University. Um, so I've moved up from Yorkshire. Um, my partner works in Edinburgh, so Berwick was right in the middle. Um, so managed to move during lockdown. Um, and we've loved it, to be honest. Uh, we're loving living close to the beach and loving the area and people are really friendly. They even say hello back when I say hi to them. <laughs> um, and yeah, loving it. So you're sort of in the middle of the two, so it's, it's sort of ideal for travelling. Um, what, what is it you do uh, as part of your, your lecturing? Yeah, so I'm lecturing uh, in sport and exercise psychology. So I'm running a module on clinical psychology and sport and exercise. Um, And I'll be teaching uh, sport psychology uh, modules and teaching dissertation students. And yeah, it's exciting. Uh, Just trying to work on putting things online to make things accessible. but yeah, I'm really in, enjoying it and it's nice being able to work from home and uh, yeah, be able to go down the beach after my work. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been difficult. Like, I can imagine you being so busy with having A, having to move like where you're living yeah. and then B, picking up a new job and all of yeah. this that's going on sort of around <laughs> it and trying to adapt to that. Like That's some achievement to get settled within two months. Yeah. Well, I was working in two jobs or three jobs before that because I was working at U- University of West of Scotland in Glasgow and I was working at York St John so I was basically commuting back and forth so now I'm feeling well, this is like quite a nice life Chill out. <laughs> <laughs> I've got time in my hands <laughs> just spend it all down the beach yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you have an extensive background in football uh, including a successful playing career do you want to talk a little bit around your playing, uh, playing career first of all 
Yeah, so when I was uh, younger, I wasn't really interested in playing football, to be honest. Uh, it was my sister that played t- football and loved it. Um, but because I was more outgoing and would talk to people, my mum made me take her along to training. <laughs> um, so it was a mixed football team and uh, no, not many girls in team. I went to a tournament though and uh, I think I scored a penalty and got a medal. So I was like, oh, quite like this. Um, so I decided to go back and keep going along. Um, and at that time, my mum and dad uh, helped develop a girls team with Benny Scobride. Um so they created it and the football team's go, still going today. Um, yeah, they got a bus, they created teams, they um, helped develop the, the girls' football team. And um, at that time, it was difficult to play. Like, we weren't allowed to play in school. Um, we didn't have a school football team. The teachers wouldn't let me play. Um, well, actually, the one of the guys uh, teachers he let me play and he would let me go play football with the boys but then the women teachers would take me out and put me in a, a gym hall of uh, table tennis and to play with the play table tennis with the girls and then I'd sneak back in and play with the boys um, so it was only when I approached a teacher um, Mrs McCann and she helped develop a, a girls football team um, so yeah it was a bit, bit strange back in the day um, and yeah, I started playing football uh, with the, the football team at East Kilbride and then I started coaching at 16. Then I was playing for a Kilmarnock uh, football team and I was a pretty busy teenager. I you know, got my coaching badge, I was coaching, I was refereeing, I was playing football uh, at the same time as you know, doing my exams and um, just trying to you know, be a teenager. So that's quite a dramatic shift, isn't it, from not wanting to play, <laughs> <laughs> just going along for your sister, into being a teenage coach and going yes. for your coaching match. I don't do things in halves. <laughs> <laughs> so I was fortunate enough uh, when I was younger to, me and my sister, got into the first ever women's football academy, which is in Durham. Um, so we were there for a couple of months, but because I was Glasgow City at the time and traveling back and forth uh, for games, it was quite expensive. And then because we were Scottish, they hadn't worked it out to get funding. So we only lasted a couple of months uh, and then allowed me to play for City um, and train with them more regularly. And then while I was playing for City, I uh, was playing in the cup final um, at Livingston, I think it was. And... Within five days, I got a contract in Iceland and moved to Iceland, where I played semi-pro there with some, there was another couple of players from Scotland. So I played in Iceland, uh, then I played in Australia for a season where I coached there as well. And then I basically went straight from Australia to America, where I got a full scholarship. And I was there doing my undergraduate, undergraduate degree in psychology, coaching football, playing football and um, during that time that's when I developed um, the girls side of a football well soccer team over there um, they they didn't have a girls team they had more of a development squad so I helped create the girls teams I also helped develop uh, the bumblebees which was three four five year olds so I had 120 kids um, <laughs> So I obviously got lots of uh, coaches and helpers to, to help with that program. Um, uh, so that that was fun. That was my my babysitting. Um, and yeah, so I was a technical direct, director over there and helped develop the, the girl side of things. Um, but I think then I was really interested in psychology. So the parents would say that I was... Um, you know, I would have my kumbaya circles and I would have the kids, you know, talk about their feelings and um, basically doing psychology <laughs> 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 And then coming back from uh, America, I played with a number of uh, teams in Scotland. So I played for Hamilton Ackies, Boromir, uh, Spartans, Hutchie Vale. Um, yeah, quite a lot of teams. <laughs> what was it like with... With being at City, were they as successful at the time? Uh, when they, when I played for them, it was probably at the beginning of their success. So uh, I had actually went to watch them when I was uh, younger because a lot of our players went to them. But that's when Laura and Cass had just started it. And 
it was very different to how they are now. So it was quite funny as I think back, being in this like, I think it was like in the, it was a grass pitch in the middle of the woods somewhere and it just was not a really good game of football. Um, to, <laughs> so to think about where they are now uh, is unreal. So when I played for them, uh, Peter Caulfield was a manager, Laura was playing. Um, it was, I love, I love playing for, for City and it was a really great bunch of, bunch of girls, but they were, it was probably at the start of them becoming the successful club they are now. I was going to say, no, and, and, and Peter, it's funny thing. It's funny how things work out because Peter's back at the club now. Um, <laughs> Peter was City's first ever. Well, although that in fairness, there was a there was a manager before that, um, a lady whose name alludes me. But Peter was the sort of the start of the successes. Tracy alludes to. So I I didn't realise Tracy and her sister <laughs> played for City, uh, and Peter was exceptionally complimentary. But yeah, he's back. Um, he's back just now. He's looking at the scouting and I think they've been busy with their catalogues over the summer, looking at players all over Europe at the moment as well as locally. So, uh, Which other Scottish players were with you in Iceland? Uh, Karen Penglas. Yeah. And uh, Maz McDonald. Okay, cool. Maz went away to America straight after Iceland and I don't know if she's back. So yeah, those two players. And while I was over there, uh, Susie Shepherd. Uh, Susie Robertson so she played over there as well um, for Westman Isles and I played for Grindavik but when one of my first games was Westman Isles and we had to go in this like five seater aeroplane to go across so being the Scottish person like oh my goodness this is amazing I was like said to the pilot can I get a shot of the plane so he showed me how to uh, move it I was moving up and down we flew over to this island it was like amazing so years later, I was speaking to Susie, and she said, oh, I played in West Miles. I said, oh, I, I flew that plane. <laughs> so she was like to my husband, Tracy flew the plane to my, my island. Um, <laughs> that was my, my claim to fame. <laughs> so was it, was it, was it, Dr. Scandinavian... Pilot, yeah. ex-footballer. <laughs> <laughs> and was, was Scandinavian football, even at that time, further ahead? Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Way ahead. I mean, at, at Grindavik, we had... Um, uh, who was players, there was a few ex-Rangers players that were playing for the guys' teams. Lee Sharp was playing for the guys' teams. And even for us, we would get the whole uh, town coming out to watch. So there was 200 people in the town. They would, everyone would come out to watch us. Um, as far as money, you know, you were getting paid a good amount of money. You were getting your food. You were getting a house. Uh, the standard of football was, like, really good. Um, so it was very professional. And that was years ago. That was like 2002 um, and Australia same thing um, I would say the football wasn't advanced but um, as far as having everything in place as far as like your kit and having a house there for you being paid having an opportunity that was in 2003 it was unreal and then even in America the standard was unbelievable and the opportunities was unreal you were playing in big stadiums you were getting tra you were traveling in uh, buses with beds you were eating in nice restaurants getting all your kit bought for you um and the standard people were so athletic so it was uh, quite challenging actually to play in america because i was a wee scottish girl trying to chase these big athletes um, <laughs> 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 so yeah it was it was uh Great playing abroad it really opened my eyes up to the opportunity you could have as a, a, a female footballer. I think I think one thing that you both said, and, and you said it last time, but you keep going on about it, is the standards thing. You both use that word about the standards and, and the infrastructure and the setup. And it's funny, I was doing my homework on that diploma today for Sir Alex Ferguson. I think one of the first things that they put in place was the foundations, the structure, the, you know, the base, the standards that... You know, when you look at other managers like Klopp and Guardiola and them, they've kind of sort of to an extent copied that. For you, both standards and, you know, that's, that's front, front and foremost. Yeah, very much so. I think that um, if you're going to do something, you do it properly and you make a commitment. You know, you make a commitment to the, the players, the parents, the women that you're working with. And whether that, you know, to me, it's, it's really about putting everything in place so the players can turn up and play. You know, I was out, you know, did all sorts of stuff at Lowick with the young ones. We were, and every home game we had to mark the pitch. So we were out there with the blue paint. Um, Richard, who was one of my assistants, uh, one of the parents, he came across and we used to go out and met. We used to have to measure and mark the pitch. So we had these long bits of string um, and a tape measure that we used to go out every, every other Saturday morning, sort of eight o'clock out there. And that, they're the bits that people don't see. 
that you know for and I, I say whoever runs football teams you know the grassroots football all of the coaches every bit of it is voluntary so what you see is a, a whole range of people doing it but I you know I, I take my hat off to everybody who does it because it's a big commitment but you just want the players to turn up get the gear on and then play but once they once they come along I expect the commitment from them too to turn up for training every week and to be there every week and not think well I fancy get shot in this week or you know, I'm, you know particularly when they're older you know, and I think you see a lot of that with some of the, the men's teams that the boys might go out and drink or do this and miss the game the next day. So, you know, the commitment has to be, has to be both, way, both ways. Tracy, for you, what was your best memories from, from playing football? Best memories are playing abroad and particularly in Australia. Um, and I think we talk about standards. Um, he had high standards, but he wasn't perfectionistic. And so my PhD is in perfectionism and trying to manage uh, people's expectations. But the coach there, he gave me a free role. I really enjoyed playing with some of the Matilda players. I trained with a New Zealand team over there. Uh, another time that went back. So I really enjoyed playing uh, with different clubs and uh, in, different, in different places. Um, I think one of my memories uh, of being in the States uh, and scoring a goal against a team that had previously thrashed us 5-0. Um, and I was on the bench uh, against James Madison University and I remember playing them and they were just run rings around me. I was chasing them all about the, the, the pitch. Um, it was horrible. And the next game, I came on and uh, first touch of the ball, scored from outside of the box. We won 1-0. So that was like one of the, <laughs> the best memories of the, the States because I thought, don't want to be run, getting run around ragged <laughs> for that. Um, and yeah, another good memory was be going away to Cyprus with the Scotland Day squad and delivering psychology there. So I uh, got to do some psychology for the full, full squad, but also worked with individual players and um, helped them for with aspects of the game. So that was that was really enjoyable experience um, to be over there. What does that sort of entail? Like what, do you sit with them on a one-to-one -on -one basis and is it sort of focused on sport or is it focused on more well-being or does it incorporate everything? Yeah, it incorporates everything. So when Anna Senor was in charge, we developed a programme that was uh, for the education camps and it was more about um, psych the psychology side of football but also well-being. So, you know, how to improve your attitude, how to set goals, how to be able to performance profile, how to talk to yourself as you would, as, as if you were a coach, um, things around confidence, about using your strengths. So a lot of it's group based, so work, how to work as a team or maybe setting goals as a team, but then other times it would, I could work with an individual on aspects, a lot of the time it's you know, around anxieties around the beat test, or fitness testing, mm -hmm. um, that was quite, you know, it's quite a stressful thing for, for, for players, especially um, when there's certain standards that they have to have to meet. And it's quite challenging to meet these standards that, you know, maybe Sweden or other countries have set. Um, so, um, yeah, a mix of both group work and then uh, individual stuff. Club 1881 is your opportunity to be part of a community of Dream Team supporters helping to transform the club's financial fortunes. For just £18.81 per month, you can help your club become a more sustainable one, safeguarding the future of Berwick Rangers Football Club and building a solid foundation for the club to target future success from. Club 1881 members receive access to exclusive JERS content ranging from podcasts to videos, player interviews to meet the management team sessions, newsletters to club shop sales and more. And if that wasn't enough, all Club 1881 members will gain free admission to all home Lowland League fixtures where they might even scoop a £200 jackpot through the bond scheme number also included in their membership fee. To become a Club 1881 member today, simply head to berwickrangers.com slash shop slash club 1881. One team, your team, dream team. For both of you, I'll start with, with you, Andy. What are you hoping to uh, achieve within the first 12 months of the programme? Well, we're running the taster sessions, so we're trying to drum up some interest. I mean, there's been quite a bit of interest already, certainly on social media. Um, and as Dave said, we're trying to get some flyers because not everybody uses social media. So 
um, get those out to shops, the schools, Scottish schools will be going back uh, before the taster sessions. So really to try and gauge the interest um, and create, a, create an environment where they feel part of the club. Uh, Tracy and I met last week and we, got, we share a lot of views about creating belonging um, and creating an environment where kids can firstly have fun and want to be there. So, you know, there are areas that we look at. I mean, the, the FA talks about the sort of four corner model, which looks at the social side, the psychological side, the physical side and the tactical side. So it is about looking at all of that and using football really as a vehicle to um, help, the, help the young girls and women feel more confident, feel fitter, enjoy it. And kids play for fun. You know, the interesting bit is when they've done research into why kids play, fun and fitness is there at the top and being with your mates and enjoying, enjoying your time and turning up and wanting to kick a ball. Um, winning games and winning leagues isn't, um, isn't, isn't, at the top of, it isn't at the top of any list, um, which is quite interesting when they do, when they do the research. Um, so it's really about creating, creating that environment where they can come along, enjoy themselves, express themselves, um, and then from that, then you move, if we can get enough girls interested, we can look at teams for next year. And then you're looking at the entering leagues and, and moving on from there, really. So, but it is about, you know, I'm sure Tracy will talk a little bit more about it. We, we've got shared principles about how we do stuff. Um, but I'll let her talk a little bit more about that because <laughs> she knows as much as I could, I could speak forever, you know that, don't you? <laughs> We met last week. I felt really bad after. I thought, oh my god, I didn't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> who, who paid for the coffee? Uh, oh, no, she got a juice. Got a juice. I, I got. Oh. A <laughs> call it in Scotland the juice. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll back up what Andy says because I, I have been listening. <laughs> a lot of it. But yeah, we want to, to create a um, sense of belonging. It's really, really important. And with that, just having kids enjoy it and feel that like they're part of something. So that relatedness with other people, feeling connected. Um, I know that when I was younger, that's what, uh, playing in a team, when I was, you know, my local team, that's what I bought. Um, and that kept me participating. So I think it's really important to find ways to have uh, kids participate and uh, creating an environment where kids have autonomy so they feel a sense of empowerment that they can make their own choices um, that there's, there's a two-way communication and that they also feel a sense of being uh, treated fairly respected and made feel welcome so mainly uh, participation but creating an environment where kids will want to participate based on those three things and I'm sure Andy would agree. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it is something we agree. It's, it's really nice, actually. I mean, when I first heard um, about Tracy's CV and saw what she'd done, and you just heard it yourself, it was like, oh, get me coat. Um, it felt <laughs> a bit like that. So, uh, to, but it's, the, it's really nice that it's not just about qualifications. It's not just about experience. It's about wanting to do the right things for the right reasons, um, giving girls confidence, being inclusive, making sure everybody feels part of it. Um, and that's something that the, I've, I've certainly seen over the last six months of Berwick is it's certainly been trying to be more connected with the town. Um, I mean, I live about 400 metres away from the ground, so well, maybe 800 metres away from the ground, so not far at all. Um, but I feel very connected now, more than I have done before. Um, and certainly the, the information going out to people, there's more people talking about Berwick Rangers. So I think this can only be good for the girls of the town and the town itself. And the surrounding areas as well. I want to bring people in. We want people to want to come along and, and enjoy themselves and come along and be looking forward to it and leave feeling much better about themselves. You know? And then we go on to develop the, the, the tactical and the technical stuff. We'll go alongside it. But everything we'll be doing, there won't be shuttle runs or running around the pitch. It will be stuff with a football and it will be about having fun and enjoying themselves. Um, and you want them to leave smiling and desperate to come back the next week. That's what we really want to create that environment. So where people feel genuinely part of something, so. It's, it's interesting, I mean, it, it's pleasing as a director who came back to the town, who doesn't live in the town, he's loved away from the town more than he's loved in it, and for Andy to say that, you know, about what he sees and how he feels, and that seems to be kind of sort of um, becoming more common. Uh, I know Craig Forsyth was out at the weekend for the first time in a while, and 
you know, first time he's probably seen a lot of people in the bub, the pubs and the bars, and you know, they're all seeing the same thing. But you know, not not being disrespectful, but it's almost like the thing that happens on a Saturday at three t- three p.m. is like neatly the least important thing, and that all the other things that make us a better better group of people and a better club, or you know, equally if not more important. And you know, think one of the things that struck me with both Andy and Tracy is, and it's something that we profess a lot at City is that it's more about making people feel like they're um, worthy, they're, that they're good young people, that they're going to be getting social skills, social development, things that are going to like last long beyond them kicking a ball around the pitch. Um, and, you know, it's to an extent it's happening with the first team. You were asking about the diploma at the beginning, Adam. It's like, you know, football's a really short career. Um, and, and for the people at the top level, you know, it is a short career. But even for the ones that don't get to the top, you know, a lot of people drop out. But if we can imprint one thing, two things, or maybe even three things on young young girls and young boys at the Better Rangers Juniors, then you know we'll be doing our job, and you know hopefully people will start to see that, and we'll get more people interested. Just uh, delivered a psychology session to a football team, and one of the questions I asked them was about their why, and you know when you have to deal with setbacks or you know dealing with change or dealing with uncertainty, like it's important to remind yourself of your why. And I know that when I was doing my PhD, my PhD was in football. Um, my, I had to go to my why because I found it obviously very challenging and my why was to help young people and I think that's my reason for, for this and helping is that you know with everything I do it's because I want to help young people and I want them to feel worthy and I want them to feel that they can achieve and that they're good people and it's their qualities so not just that they're a footballer it's that they're a kind caring person and that they start to recognise their why and their purpose and that might be football for them or it might be that football is a vehicle for them to go on and do something else and I think that's what uh, could be so amazing about d- doing this in Berwick and giving kids that opportunity that they haven't had um, and, and especially when we know about statistics around mental health and you know mental health within even sport and that you know it's not a protective factor but it can help and it can give that sense of you know belonging competence all of the things that young people need to flourish um, so yeah that's why I'm excited mm. yeah definitely I mean we had just thinking of, of the girls team in Lowick we had a real range of abilities um, one of the girls in fact was a, a championship swimmer a real top I mean she still is top top swimmer and her mum used to say and she used to have to go swimming every you know, five o'clock in the morning and stuff and her mum used to say to me sometimes you know I wish she'd just give up this football but she just really loves to come along and she wasn't the best player we had but she came along and enjoyed every single minute of it. And that's that bit about, you know, we want kids to be doing multi-sports. We want them to be trying new things, learning new things and supporting each other. And what's really interesting is meeting Tracy last week. The two of us have both worked in residential care with uh, children, looked after with uh, children in care. Um, Tracy's worked in Edinburgh and I work in East Lothian. And what was really interesting that with the, some of the names and some of the people we've worked with and, crisscrossed so our paths are sort of crossed in the past so it's 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 it seems to be you know it seems to be meant to be at the moment so I'm really really positive too um and if parents are listening to this and interested in bringing the daughter along uh, what could they expect <laughs> uh fun just have a fun time get to meet other young people who enjoy playing football or just want to run around and have a bit of fun they get to they get to come to Barrett Rangers which would be great uh, to come to the stadium which is really good um, you can, if you check the Facebook site or the website, you can see the, the sign-up sheet. So we're looking at getting people signed up. It is free. It doesn't say that on the thing, but it is completely free. So they're free taster sessions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll get to meet the young people. We'll get to meet the kids. We'll get to meet the parents. We'll, they will be available to talk to them. I've got three other coaches coming along as well that have worked with me in the past, which is great. I've got Dawn and Richard and um, Kev, Kev is coming along as well. So... They'll be there to help out and it will, we'll be setting up, you know, setting up nice, easy, straightforward stuff for the kids to just be, just to enjoy it and have some fun and get to meet each other and uh, see if they enjoy it. I mean, it really is a taste of the session. So Tracy and I have got to work that out yet, depending on, and it will depend on how many girls we get, what ages they are, because, you know, you might have 10, 15 year olds and eight, seven or eight year olds. So we'll have to differentiate the stuff we do, but uh, it will be about uh, making sure it's just a fun day and getting to meet us and, See if they like us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll back that up. Uh, fun, uh, challenging environment. Um, 
but I think both Andy and I will just make sure that their daughter will be at the forefront of our decisions, uh, that sessions are safe, they'll start and finish in time. Um, and I know that both Andy and I would just encourage kids to be unique, be themselves, be yeah. creative. Um, and yeah, I think that's what, you know, parents and the daughter could expect from, from the day and from a uh, longer term involvement. Yeah, one thing I find challenging, having been involved in um, kids' football, is coaches who you know stand on the sideline, they do one course with their clipboard, screaming and shouting at kids, and kids are too frightened to do stuff, so and frightened of making mistakes. Now, for me, the whole idea about football is is it's not just about the the winning; it's about the taking part; it's about the enjoying it. Obviously, all kids want to win all the time, you know that's what they want to do, but. Coaches shouldn't be in it for their own glory. I, mean, I see lots of coaches living their lives out um, from the kids' results. So it's about the kids learning, not screaming and shouting at them from the sidelines, letting them be the, the teachers of the game too. You know, and what, we want to, what I always wanted to create, and I used to say to my players all the time, is I want you to be intelligent footballers. I want you to be able to make your own decisions on the pitch. Because once they cross that line, there's nothing we can do about it. And that's, that was the, I think that was probably the hardest thing I found going into coaching from being a player manager or a player was the fact that when I was on the pitch, I thought I could influence it a wee bit. I'm not saying I was the greatest player in the world, but, you know, I always thought oh, I could do OK. But when they go across that line um, and I couldn't do anything about it, I was saying to Tracy last week, you know, it was the only time I ever got stressed in football. I never, I never got stressed at all playing or playing in cup finals. But watching a team going across that white line, dear God, it was awful. So, yeah, <laughs> that's something I've had to work on so uh, yeah but it's not no, about, I, I, it really isn't about the coach and what I saw with both teams is uh, both teams I managed the women and the girls is they ended up being really really successful and none of it was about jumping on there screaming the shit on sidelines if you give them the tools they can go to work so yeah I think I, I probably need to spend a bit of time with Tracy about that <laughs> 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 I possibly possibly need to go back and look at my reason why <laughs> but uh, no to be honest as a coach uh, it's funny actually I've just picked up a team this week up here in Falkirk I'm going to I start back tomorrow night so I'm quite excited the boys on the 16s team just helping out but um, there's nothing better than seeing you know um, kids get on I think what was interesting last week we had um, Max Ashma from um, Rangers from the academy so I, I had Max in Italy uh, in a tournament where we played Germany, um, Italy and Russia. And I remember there was 20-odd kids in that changing room and they were told at the end that said nicely, not many of them would make it over the finishing line. You know, so Max is actually, to an extent, he's not, not made it, but he's gone away and reinvented himself. Now he's at Ibrox uh, doing stuff in the academy. Um, interestingly, somebody else that was on the plane was Kevin Wolf. You know, so, Ke so Kevin was away with us in Italy and, you know, Kevin's now doing his diploma in sport and leadership. And then I saw today Daniel Harvey's just signed for um, Milton Keen Dawn. So Daniel was on the same plane as well. So um, for us, we've got a responsibility, I think, you know, just making these kids better, better people. And, you know, that's the thing for me, um, you know, with the parents and that, you know, come along and trust us and, you know, give it a go. And, you know, as somebody from Berwick, I can see it. You know, sometimes people in Berwick can be a wee bit sceptical and cynical. I think in the six months we've been back at the club, we've delivered on a lot of our promises, if not most of them. So, you know, we're not going to fail on this one. We've got two absolutely outstanding individuals that, you know, both of them was, as I said before, a bit of a lottery win for us. So um, now we just need to back them up from the club. And, you know, Warren is absolutely, absolutely desperate to make this a success um, as well. So, and, you know, there's some more exciting news coming with the foundation in next week. I think they've actually, you know, um, uh, appointed another further three trustees which will, which will be ratified at their board meeting on Monday and I know all three of them and they're all outstanding individuals so you know this this will be a success um, and you know hopefully the parents will trust us and come along and give it a go. I, I would be remiss of us not to finish on uh, famous friends and famous stories not Tracy because we did cut that out the last one. <laughs> uh, are we expecting it? it was interesting because I called him Willie the last time and you called him Uncle Billy. Yeah, I call him Uncle. I'll call him Uncle Billy, but he gets called Willie. So everyone knows him as Willie Donicky or Will, but I always I just call him Uncle Billy. <laughs> you know, you know what's interesting though. Since I last saw you, for some obscure reason, you talked about him scoring an own goal um, for Scotland. Did you watch? I it? also saw Gary Gillespie scoring an even better own goal for Scotland. 
oh, on really? Twitter last week, so <laughs> it, it made me think. But yeah, so you you hopefully we'll, we will see your uncle at some stage up at um, Shelfield Park. Yeah, my uncle said he's willing to come down and, and help, and he's a, an amazing uh, coach. He's very calm, uh, very zen, relaxed. Um, yeah, he's actually he's a very a positive presence you just feel like you're floating you know when he yeah. talks he's all chilled out and uh <laughs> yeah, for the listeners who have not put two and two together tracy's uncle is willie donaghy he used to play for everton and man city and scotland i i always remember him as a player because i was still i would be young then but um i always found him quite a, gen, a gentle person yeah. a gentle player but don't get me wrong you you wouldn't mess type thing on the pitch but as an individual, he came across as somebody that was really quite gentle. Yeah, yeah. left-footed, uh, scored an own goal against Wales. That's what he's famous for. If I ever say his name, that's what people, people say. Uh, he played for Scotland, Man City, and he was the coach at Everton when they won the Cup. I think it was in 2000. And that's all from us this week. Thank you very much to our guest Tracy and Andy for joining us. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Letter BRSA podcast. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed the episode, please tell your friends, family and followers, and we'll speak to you soon.